Yeah. All right, so I'm going to get started here. Yeah, then it doesn't have to move. Yeah, there you go. You're doing the center of the bed that works pretty well. So. That's All right, Johnny, you guys sit back here. Bring us yeah. down. Hey, um, I'm glad you're here. Just a couple of announcements. It's been an exhausting week. We had work camp this week. As all of you are well aware, so it's been a busy week, and uh, we thank you, everybody who helped us get through it. Uh, we volunteered in the kitchen, we volunteered before prepping for all that stuff, we shopped for things for the adults that were present, for the kids that came. It was a little rough at the beginning of the week, but uh, you know, as always, you take a step back and you realize everything you've accomplished, and you say, we had a good, good week, and it's all because of everybody. And, pulling together and doing some great things. So we were able to rehab again. Uh, we worked on two handicapped ramps and we worked on uh, uh, capped uh, porch and we worked on another porch that we were replacing and some set of stairs and uh, we did a little bit of work around the church so it was a good week. We met a lot of wonderful people and had some fantastic God sightings. Uh, in particular when Elle was going shopping for the picnic that night for the kids and she was buying all the picnic supplies. All of the big wigs were out at Walmart and they were watching Ella buying this stuff and one of them came over to her and said, what, what, you guys have a nice big picnic, my goodness you're buying a lot. And she said, well it's for work camp for the kids, they've been here all week and uh, it's been a great event. And he said, oh, he opened up his wallet, gave her 50 bucks and said, please take this as my donation to the kids, buy whatever you need for them. What's that? That's, that's what we call a God saying. We look for those things. We're so negative about the world. We need to look for the things where on a regular basis, God is speaking to us, even through the hands of a very kind person to open up his wallet to, to help uh, pay for some really fun things for the kids that night. And so we're grateful for that. Uh, look for those God sayings every day because it's so easy to be brought down by the negative when there's always almost every single day, so much more positive than God is doing in our lives. So let's look up, look out, and keep our eyes open. Will it be a little bit quieter summer the rest of the, the next two months or so? But you will notice in the bulletin, if you've grabbed one, there are two events coming in early September that are really important that I want to make sure you're aware of. One, of course, is the uh, continuation of our visioning session. And um, so important that I can't even remember what the other one is. I, I'm just so tired. But new members class? New members class, that's right. We do have some new folks joining the congregation, and we will be using the month of September for new members. If you are online watching, I know there are some people who really have a hard time getting here physically, and you really want to be a part of those classes, let me know. We will actually uh, do a, a Zoom or some type of situation like that so you can be a part. Uh, we want you to uh, feel like you're a part of the congregation, um, and we'd love to have you if you can. So that's coming up. Uh, keep that in mind. We also are going to be doing a graduation party for a girl named Daylin, uh, uh, who's been coming with our youth group and so forth. She just really has no support. Keep your uh, no parental support that, that cares for her. We just want to adopt her in and make sure that our congregation lets her know that we love her. I'm not sure when that's going to be. We're working on that now. Yes, what do you mean? Uh, I just wanted to make sure I didn't see it noted that uh, game night will also be on a hiatus for the summer. Okay, yeah, and that's, I think return, it's the best thing, because, yeah. When we return, we're gonna try and do one, once a month. Yeah. One weekend, one Wednesday month. I think that's a, probably a good plan. We got it seated, and uh, then we're gonna get uh, going on that. Right, Johnny? Yep. All right, sounds good. Hey, let's uh, let's get to worshiping. This is why we came, so let us uh, prepare our hearts and sing. You are my shepherd, my shadow needs. You lead me by the peaceful streets and you refresh my life. You hold my hand and Yeah. 
Christ, the love of God, the meaning of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Awesome with you. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet. successful week that we were able to bless our community and those around us and not even just those who we serve but uh, again many who saw what we're doing and asked us questions about why we would spend a week of our time uh, doing these types of things and we got the opportunity to share about how that's a privilege it's what we do in response to God's love and we just pray for those who are hurting this day I'm going to pray this prayer for our country because I, I, I literally think our, our Democrats and Republicans have absolutely lost their minds. I just, I'm sorry, but uh, um, God, uh, I, I'm just disturbed that we Christians are falling in line to either one of these parties right now. It just, I don't get it, because it seems like we're trying to replace Jesus and the kingdom of God with uh, things that are made by human hands. And so I'm praying a new prayer today, God. Um, the prayer is simply this that you would help us to see that the greatness of this country is in our next door neighbor and what's across the street and how we love those next to us. It has nothing to do with this political system. It never has had anything to do with our political system. It's certainly not in the Democrats and it's certainly not in the Republicans. And so God, we need to stand fast against that and reject those as though they are somehow representative of the kingdom of heaven. Neither one of them are. Their political rules, we vote for those, it's fine, one might, we might think is better than the other, but God, none of them represent Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus, and all about how we love and care for the neighbors next to us. And so God, I'm praying for your church to stand up and truly represent Jesus in these coming months, because our world, our country is just lost in chaos right now. There's way too much shouting, yelling, and, and noise going on that has nothing to do with Jesus. And so I'm just praying that you would help us to quiet the tenor and stand up against anyone who dehumanizes, diminishes, or speaks against another brother, uh, another sister, another person in our country, until we can see that the next door neighbor who votes completely opposite of us are human beings who love, they deserve to be loved and cared for. Then we should stand against any system and any politician who represents anything other than that. And so God, I stand fast with the hurting the heartache, those in heartache, those, God, who are poor and impoverished, those who are homeless, God, we stand for them because that's who you stood with, those on the edges of society, not those in power. God, you stand on the edges with the uh, those who are illegal. I hate to say it, that's what the Bible says. We stand on the side of those who are have no home, have been shed, driven from their country, and we are told to have kindness and compassion on those who, um, who have escaped the tragedy of their countries to ours. This is what the Bible says. And so let's start living by what the Bible says and not by what politicians say. 
There we go. That's my sermon. That's also my prayer. Because I think we're a better country than what we're seeing here right now. And the betterness of this country is in the people that we see. And so God, let us again love our neighbors. Care for those around us. Care for the poor. And reject the wealthy and the power. And Lord, uh, all the other things we have in our hearts today, we just want to give you thanks for this week, the celebration of the 4th of July. We give you thanks again for those men and women in the military who protect our for safety and freedom and pray that this would be a quiet and peaceful week for them. And bring them home safely. Give us that day and age where we can take all of those guns, all of those weapons and beat them into something constructive, into plowshares, as the Bible says, that produce food for the world. Because that's truly what your will is for us. And Lord, we also give you thanks for these celebrations that stay for the 50th anniversary of the Turners. We give you thanks for that. For Connor at a celebration yesterday for his graduation, for Day Lynn, for Pierce. But we also lift up those who need you today for uh, Carrie, just wet and welded together with her partner for life just at the altar two weeks ago. But now she's in the hospital. We just pray that you would be with her. I know it's quite a concern what she might be struggling with. Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we take a moment of prayer to lift these concerns to you. And we fall down. We cry holy. again over by the boat to the other side, a large crowd had gathered around him, and they stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and upon seeing him, fell at his feet and pleaded with him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off, and with him a large crowd was following Jesus, and he, they were pressing in on him. A woman who had a hemorrhage for twelve years and endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, was not helped at all, but instead had become worse after hearing about Jesus, came into the, through the crowd behind Jesus and touched his cloak. For she had been saying to herself, If I just touch his garments, I will get well. So immediately the flow of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? His disciples said, and you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you ask, who is it who touched me? But Jesus looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be cured of your disease. But while he was still speaking, people came from the house of the synagogue, and the official said, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any further? But Jesus, overhearing what had been spoken, said to the synagogue official, Don't be afraid, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue of the official, and they saw the commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing. And after ending, they said, Why are you making such a commotion and weeping? This child has not died, but is only asleep. And they began to laugh at Jesus. But putting them all outside, he took along the child's father, mother, and his own companions, and he entered the room where the child was in bed, and taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk, and she was 12 years of age, and immediately they were completely astonished. And he gave them strict orders that no one was to know about these things. And he told them to have something given to her to eat. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Heavenly Father, bless this word today that we might be inspired by it. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, this lesson is appropriately really scattered throughout your, your, hand, your bulletin for today. It doesn't exactly, it wasn't copied the way it was intended to be copied. So, in essence, it looks like um, this, 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 this page to this page, this page to this page, it's fine. It's not set up as a booklet form, but that's okay. We will get through it, and I'm just going to be scattering all over the place in the sermon anyway, because uh, if I had to do it all over again, I'd reorganize this thing. Anyway, so let's take a look at it. Uh, I want to talk about illness and death today, because this is what our lesson is all about. And I can tell you from personal perspective that when you have a child who is sick and uh, you are just desperate, you will do anything for them. You know, my daughter basically slept away the last six years of her life because of uh, what uh, six, five or six boys did to her six years ago. It's been six years ago that she had the living daylight speed out of her. We would go anywhere and be desperate to see anybody who could help her. And uh, you seek alternative forms of medication. You seek out faith healers, whatever it is you want to do. Even like today in our lesson, Jair, uh, the, uh, like Jairus, he was willing to defy his own religious leaders and seek out Jesus, who was, by the way, considered a charlatan. They did not want him hanging with Jesus. This man, after all, was a public official and was an official in the synagogue, and so we, he was going against the ruling of his synagogue to go seek out Jesus, but the man was desperate. His daughter was dying. You will do anything if your child is dying. But we are told that on the way, Jairus' daughter, to see J cure, J cure Jairus' daughter, and I'm going to come back to the word cure in just a minute, a woman touched Jesus' hem of his robe, and she was cured immediately. Now, a little bit about this. The Bible is a little bit delicate about this. It talks about her 12-year hemorrhage. I'm going to tell you what it's talking about. She had a 12-year period. Imagine that. I'm looking at you since maybe you can relate, not because you've had a 12-year period. I'm not trying to point that out, right? But you never I don't know. know. You never know. But the point is, is that 12 years she was struggling with this. And it says in the Bible that she endured much suffering at the hands of physicians, and they literally bankrupted her. She was poor, impoverished, had nothing to her name. She, too, was desperate. So I want to tell you, first of all, two background things about this before we get back and engage the lesson. I want you to remember Jewish law. A woman who had her period was considered ritually unclean. She could not touch anyone. Be, nobody could touch her. She could not touch anything that anybody else was going to touch. Because if they did touch her, or she touched them, or she touched something that she passed on to you, like a book or something like this, you would then also now be ritually unclean, and you would have to go into a season about seven days of isolation and go through some purity rituals in order to cleanse yourself of such filthiness that you are associated with a woman who's having her period, right? So imagine this, for 12 years, that means that this woman couldn't go to synagogue, couldn't visit with her family. If she was married, she certainly probably was no longer married by this point. Uh, people could set food down for her and run away, right? But they couldn't take anything from her. She, was, she couldn't live in a house anywhere because if you had an adjoining wall with her, guess what? Your wall was now filthy and dirty, okay? It's crazy, all these rules and all these wrong laws because she was supposedly impure for this. And just with a touch of Jesus' robe, she is cured. And you know, the disciples are like, Jesus, you're looking for the person who touched her. There's hundreds of people, thousands of people pushing in, but Jesus knew there was some person who touched him with the intention of receiving this cure. Now, before I go on, I'm going to stop, and I want to discuss what the, why I'm making the distinction between being cured and being healed. And this is actually on that last page. That's where I wish I'd put this up here further. You need to understand how Jesus, how the Gospel of Mark uses these two words, curing and healing. 
Mark distinguishes between the two. The word sozo, which we also translate as salvation, literally means to make well, to make whole, to make complete. Okay? It is used three times in this passage, and Mark uses it very intentionally to distinguish it from being cured. Iaomai. Iaomai means to be cured. Something for which you're cured is something that doesn't necessarily last. You cure your door. You fix your door. Well, your door is going to be broken again someday, right? You fix your car. You're going to have to fix it again some other time. You heal a relationship, it's healed forever. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Well, right, but that's the point. The healing from Jesus is something that is permanent. It indicates a permanent status. So this is important when you apply it to this lesson. <clears throat> this woman was cured of what? Period. Her issue of blood. Her period. She was healed. Now we can go back to the other lesson. It uses it very distinctly in Mark. She was cured of that 12-year period. But that's not a healing. We get faith healers today who go around and celebrate this idea. Oh, we healed you of cancer. <clears throat> Nobody's healed of cancer. You're cured for a time, but you're still going to die. Death, life is terminal for every single one of us. Whatever cure they might have, and they act as though they somehow do it. Healing is always a gift of God, and healing is always something that indicates a permanent status. Curing is something that's temporary. You've been cured of cancer, good for you. You're still going to die. Jesus' intention, what do you think it is? It's not to cure us of cancer. Jesus' intention is to heal us so we might have a relationship with him forever. That's the difference between cures and a healing. So this woman who is cured of her issue of blood, Jesus turns and looks at her. She's embarrassed because guess what she's just done by touching Jesus' hem of his robe? Made Jesus unclean. Do you think Jesus gives a crap about that? No. You want to know why? Because that's Old Testament dogma. That's ritual purity. It doesn't mean anything. He doesn't care. Also, by touching him, he made her clean. He did make her clean. That's true. But Jesus ultimately destroys, on that moment, demonstrates to us, he destroys Old Testament dogma, rules and regulations that bind us. That he also he heals her of that. She no longer has to be obligated to those Old Testament rules and rituals. He also heals her relationship with men. Did you notice it just told us who was it who oppressed her? Men oppressed her and took all her money and gave her nothing in return. She's now healed of that relationship with men. She now has an equal status with men. She's no longer underneath of them. Okay? But at that time, was that equal to equal to a man? Yes, by Jesus. By Jesus. No, no, wait a minute. Do you notice that Jesus had, okay, this is important. Jesus had disciples that were both men and women. It makes it very clear. Only the 12 men walked with him in the wilderness, but he did have tw disciples who were women. And he uses that word of them. And, by the way, we also discussed this the other day. Peter is called... His moniker is what? Peter the Rock. Mary Magdalene, that word Magdalene is not a city name, it's not a last name, it's a nickname. Guess what it stands for? Fortress. Fortress. The New Testament church had Peter the Rock and Mary the Fortress. Monks in the uh, in 1700s decided that they didn't like the fact that the Bible held up Mary as an equal to Peter. And so they diminished her by making her the prostitute of a New Testament story and saying, she's not worthy of that. Women are not worthy of that. Jesus lifted women up to equality. It's humans that do that, Christians who do that, who use Old Testament law <clears throat> and misunderstand the Bible. 
In creation, man and woman were created what? Equal. Jesus is restoring that equality. So yes, it is true that in the New Testament time, women were treated as lesser than. But not in Jesus' kingdom. <clears throat> For anyone who's a Christian, any Christian who says that a woman is to be treated subservient to the man is not reading the scriptures correctly. She is equal to the man. And so Jesus is casting off that status of woman is lesser than the man and lifting her up. This is one of the episodes in which we see that happen. But also one other thing is healed. So Jesus heals the inequity of Old Testament dogma. He heals the relationship between her and men. She's now equal to the men. Okay. She heals. He, Jesus ultimately heals her relationship with God. Cures her body, heals all those relationships. The same thing happens in the story as we continue with the narrative to this little girl. Remember that little girl? <clears throat> she died. Jesus didn't make it. 12 year old little girl. And it's sad. And everybody's crying. And Jesus said, She's not dead. They all laugh at him with credulity. And uh, see, because death for Jesus is just simply another step. It's a fertile ground in which God does something new. That's why death is such an important thing. We have to die to self and be raised in newness of life. Ultimately, you're going to die in this side of the kingdom to be raised in newness of life with, to live with God. Okay? So death is fertile ground for God to do something brand new. And Jesus touches her and cures her of death. Physical death. But guess what? That poor girl, she's got to face death a second time. She's dead. She's gone. Okay? But Jesus offered her something in addition. Healing. So I think, you know, her raising up from the dead, that's pretty spectacular. That's nothing. That's not the miracle. The miracle is the new life that they have in Jesus Christ. The healing that Jesus gives to this family in their relationship with God. So this is the purpose of these two stories today. So again, what does Jesus want to heal? Not your cancer. That's just a cure. Relationship with others as well as God. That's right. Relationship with others, relationship with God, relationship with the planet. Remember, we've been placed here to care for God's planet. We've done a horrible job of caring for God's planet. We can't honestly say, look God, we've done a good job caring for the planet. God's going to say, really? And how many species of animals have died under your watch because of human activity? We've taken care of the planet? I don't think so. It says very clear in the Old Testament, we're, uh, Genesis, that we are supposed to make the earth productive so that the animals might thrive. So God wants to heal our relationship also with the planet, with each other, and with God. Ultimately, our bodies will receive healing when? in the fertile ground of death. And then God will raise us up to new life. Curing, healing. Eh, Jesus cures us once in a while, but it's only temporary. The real thing Jesus wants for us is that healing of our relationships with each other. Let us pray. Goodness. We thank you, God, for the healing that's already begun in our lives. We pray that you continue to work your healing in this world. May it bring to it a permanency of restoration of relationships. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to do a couple of nutrition things here today. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and know.
that, Johnny. I didn't check the verses. Uh, yet. Is that only God with the Lord? Is that the only verse we have? This is the other verse, and then the uh, that's past the chorus. Or is well, that that's it. We only have two verses. Okay, we'll do one more time. That's there's good. multiple verses in here. Don't What's worry. That? If, if which one do you want to do? So sorry if this is a. Uh, I'm breaking the entire thing, everybody. It's okay. <laughs> it's been the whole day like this. Do you have not a shadow can rise? Um, shadow can rise. Um, I'm trying to learn. If we don't have any other verses, that's okay, John. <laughs> Let's just sing this verse oh, again. Sha no shadow can rise. Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> not a shadow can rise. Not a cloud in the sky. But a spot. giving thanks for God's healing of our lives. This, this meal represents what God truly wants to do with us, heal us, a permanent status of in our relationship with God, that we're always restored in our relationship with Him and with one another. That's what Holy Communion represents. And so we do remember how on the night in which He's betrayed our Lord Christ, took bread, and after He'd given thanks, He broke it, He gave it to His disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and he blessed it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink you all of it, for this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people. For, this, for as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us prepare the meal which God has so graciously provided us. Body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus given and shed for you. Amen. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus bless us and keep us in His grace and peace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the word of this day and for the healing that you started in our lives and will promise to bring us to completion in our deaths and the new life then that we will have in Jesus Christ. Until then, we're still living in this status of temp this temporary status. But let us again seek, God, that healing in our relationship with each other, with your planet, and with, with those around us, and in particular, most importantly, with you. That we might be your servants of love in this world. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to see another great traditional song today. Not usual fare for this service, but I think it's important for those who do come to the service, they get to see some of these great traditional songs too. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Lord. Thanks, Thanks the, uh, I will God. see you all next week. Amen. Amen to that. Right. Thank you all for joining us. I don't know. It's online. Nice to see you. One or two. I haven't been. Oh, we need to turn it on. Because I couldn't do anything. They literally threw me out of the game.